book of Judges, chapter number 6, and uh, so everybody get your Bibles open, please, and we'll start chapter 6 tonight. I, I really, really want to run through this chapter uh, really quick, so, because I have so much to get to, so tonight we'll start here in Judges, chapter 6, and the major part of this chapter is the, the great story, or at least the beginning, of the great story of Gideon. Gideon, one of the great Old Testament characters, tremendous stories, tremendous life, tremendous story of faith and human nature, and you can see yourself in these Old Testament characters' lives if you'll just look with a spiritual mind. The Bible don't, God don't reveal the Bible to somebody that's just smartest. God reveals the Bible to somebody that's hungry for it. The best way to learn the Bible is, is hunger for it. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And, and the best way to come to the Bible is have your heart right when you approach the Word of God. Then you'll get the truth. And that's what I hope, I trust you have tonight. I've been studying this all evening today. Today, I just, I've really been enjoying studying uh, Judges, and I'm going to go fast. You could stay in the half of this chapter for three months just studying stuff. So I'm just going to point out stuff, and you're going to have to go back and get some of it on your own. Ready? Judges 6, 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. There we go again. Ain't that something? Here they go again. Remember when I told you at the first starting? Here it is. Get right. God blesses. Take it for granted. Backslide. Bam. Cry out for deliverance, get right. God blesses, prosperity, cry out uh, and, and forget God, backslide, bam, you hit the ground. And then you cry out to God over and over. The great law of human collapse. That means, that means you're much more likely to backslide when everything's going good than you are when things are going bad. Most people backslide when things are going good. There are a few that give up when times get hard. But most people backslide when everything's going good. And every time he would deliver them, every time, I think seven times in this book, there they do that. So here they did. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Now, we're going to notice here that when, when you sin and you go against God, he's going to let something happen. He always does. You, I, I'm telling you, if you don't believe it, I, if, if I didn't believe the Bible for no other reason, I would believe it because every time I've ever done anything wrong against something happens, bam, he gets me. He gets me. And if you don't believe that, you, you're just an immature Christian, I promise you, buddy. So uh, uh, he, he gave him over to the hand of Midian to serve a, a false dictator or a wicked dictator seven years. Now, you'll notice in your Bible the number seven popping up, popping up over and over and over. And many times you'll notice the number seven and 40 together. Why God does this maybe is, is a mystery. We know that seven in the Bible represents completion. That's a whole study we could talk about all night tonight. You know that the number 40 in the Bible usually represents what we call probation. Jesus tempted 40 days in the wilderness. The children of Israel, 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, over and over and over. Job uh, and others. Uh, the book of Je the flood, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Probation or punishment or tribulation. But the weird thing about 7 and 40 mentioned let me just mention these. You, you, I ain't going to turn to them, so you write them down if you want to. You look at, at Genesis 7, 4. It talks about 7 and 40. Genesis 25 and verse 17. Ishmael is 130, and then it said, and 7, for no reason at all. 2 Kings 8 and verse 9, it said 40 camels, and then 7 years. Why not 6? Why not 5? You reckon the Lord's trying to tell you something? 2 Kings 12, 1, it said the seventh year and 40 years. Seventh year and 40 years. But let me show you a weird one. Numbers chapter 13, verse 25, it says 40 days. And then verse 21, it says seven years. Uh, 
Temptation and 40. Flood and 40. And it'll say stuff like, like that one in Numbers 13, 25. Let me tell you what it does. It'll say something like, Hebron and this city and this city and this city. And it'll just say, Hebron was built seven years before these other cities. Now, why in the world would he put that in the Bible? Why would it just... Going along here and there, Hebron was built seven years before. Don't you know there's thousands of cities? And the Lord had 40 and 7, 40 and 7, all the way through that book. I'm going to tell you something, people. When you pick this book up right here, that ain't no ordinary book. There's more in there than people realize they are. There's about 10,000 times more in there than these milk radio programs and TV programs you get where you get nothing but uh, healing and feel good and miracles and wonderful and God loves you. There's a lot in that book. It's prophecy. And you're going to see it again here tonight. Move. Let's move. To verse 2. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. See, the Lord let them get beat. The Lord let you get beat down if you sin against him. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them den which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Now, that stronghold, that's another study. You can study that throughout the Bible. Stronghold. Sometimes the devil has strongholds in our lives. Strong it would be like a cave or a, a bunker, like a, like a, what do you call them things? Where these, these doom day preppers <laughs> get down? Uh, yeah, like a fallout shelter, a bomb shelter or something, where they get down in there and hide. Verse 3. It was when the Israel had sunk, had sown, the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites, that's the flesh. Remember, all this is spiritual. You do wrong, that flesh will come. Children of the east, there it come. Those kings of the east come in the book of Revelation and attack. That's all prophetic. Even they came up against them and encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth. So in other words, the children of Israel planted a bunch of gardens, and the enemy come in to eat it up. That's what's happening to our country tonight. Our country, buddy, when God's blessed our country, they wasn't nothing in the world like the United States. But now our enemies are coming in and spoiling our goods. And there's no doubt about it. Let's move. Verse 4. And they camped about them, increased till thou comest to Gaza. That's that Gaza over there on the east bank. You hear about the coast there? Gaza, Gaza Strip. Left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. They kill their animals. They eat their gardens. Uh, they came up with their cattle in their tents in verse 5. And they came as grasshoppers for multitude. You know why it, it, uh, you know why it uh, describes the enemy as grasshoppers a lot of times? Because they're, they're known for just, just wiping out locusts and just destroying them, eating the leaves off the trees and everything else, just totally wiping them out. For they and their camels, look at verse 5. Came, their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Now, again, I'm, I'm teaching you how to read the Bible. See where it says without number? See where it says without number? How many of you, be honest with me, have read the Bible before, and you'll come up on one of them says where it says uh, no man could count or without number, and you say, that ain't really right. We could count them. We have computers. Now, that's ever crossed your mind. Raise your hand. Has mine. Has mine. Now, when the Bible says that, it means that there's not a man there that could count all them camels. When God told Abraham, see, that's, that's why people say, when God told Abraham that his seed would be as the stars of the, of the heavens, see, people say, see there. He don't have trillions like they're stars. And that's a mistake. No, 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 no. The Bible's a practical book. And it means just look up there and see how you can't count all them stars. That's the sand of the sea. That's how you won't even be able to count all your kids. The Bible's a practical book. There's always some smart aleck trying to say, trying to get real technical and say a whale's not a fish or, or um, the eye of the camel's eye was a gate. You know, there's always somebody trying to find a... Uh, you know why they do that? So they can live like they want to. Trying to skin. Uh, excuse not to answer to God. I can live like a devil and don't have to answer to him. But you know what we are here at our church? We are Bible believers. We are Bible-believing Christians. We have a great heritage. It goes all the way back to the apostles. We are not in the minority, brother, in real Christianity. We're on the right side. 
and we say, let God be true and every man a liar. And we say, you say, well, uh, a whale ain't a fish. By, by nowadays definition, in their definition it might not be, but in the Bible definition it is. You're going to take the Bible definition or theirs. There's a lot of things. I'll show you another one. Look at the next verse. Look at the next verse here. It says, uh, and Israel, verse 6, was greatly impoverished. People flip out over a word like that. Oh, we need a new version. Now, come on, people. If you went to the 7th or 8th grade, you could figure out what impoverished means. Somebody tell me. What does it look like? What, look right in the middle of it. Poverty. Poverty. Is that really that hard to understand? And wouldn't it be a good idea just to keep a dictionary, and if there's a word like that, look it up? But good night, I never went to college or nothing, and I read about impoverished. What does that look like? You just got through reading, they got all their crops gone. And the next verse said, poverished. Duh. I mean, you don't have to have a new version of the Bible that said they lost everything. You know, I mean, because you'll lose a bunch of other verses. See, you know, one man said, I want my Bible to read like a newspaper. I don't. I want my Bible to read like the Word of God. In pure English. That impoverished is much purer English than uh, they lost, lost their crops, you know, or something like that. Verse, because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel, look at verse 6. They're getting right with God again. Cried unto the Lord. And that's, let me show you how good God is. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Stop right there. Isn't God good? Couldn't you testify that you've sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned, and when you got down and cried to the Lord, he heard you and helped you out? Amen. Amen. He's a good God. He's a good God. Lord in mercy, if I had a dime for every time I said, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I'd be rich. Amen. And he's always heard me. He's always heard my prayer, and he's never turned me down. He's never said, sorry, the bank's out of grace. There's enough grace in the bank to pay for everything you ever have done, are doing, or ever will do. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But if you need it, it's there. Thank God. And he said, thus saith the Lord, the prophet did. He called a preacher, buddy. I brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of Egypt, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out and gave you their land. And I said, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods, little g, of the Amorites. That's all them crazy people. Hittites, all them, including the Amorites. Whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. See, he come and rebuked them. Now, at verse 11, we start one of the greatest stories in the Old Testament. The great story of Gideon. We're going to study this man for just a few minutes tonight. And if you've got a question, you, I might have to ask you to hold it for a minute until I get through or you, we can talk about it. Verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord, angel of the Lord, and sat under an oak, which was an Oprah. Why does it say that? Don't you think that's a weird thing? You just read the Bible. Just, why do you think it said where he sat? What does it matter where he sat? And really, what does it matter what kind of tree it was? Why would God take the time to say it was an oak tree? I mean, wouldn't you think the Lord, the Lord he come and sit and an angel appeared in the sky and the, he's under an oak. But there's a lot of study about that oak in the Bible. And more than likely, I hate to ruin you Easter, but it was an oak the Lord was crucified, not dogwood. I know them old legends and stuff like that. Uh, but there's a lot more to that oak tree. Absalom hanging from that oak, anybody's hair, picture of the Antichrist and all kind of stuff and, the, and all kind of stuff, but we'll not get into that tonight. But angel of the Lord came that pertained to Joash, Ab, Ab, that right? And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. He was in there threshing wheat and keeping it hid so they'd have something to eat. He's hiding it. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And the verse before said he's hiding. And the angel says, You're a mighty man of valor. See how God looks at things different. We'd see him in there. We wouldn't think there's a mighty man of valor. He hid in there. God knows, a, he knows what a person's made out of. 
And he, 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 knows, he knows the real thing when he sees it. And this angel of the Lord, I didn't, I didn't know this when I first got saved. Matter of fact, I've been, I'd been saved for a few years before I got it figured out. The angel of the Lord, many, many times in the Old Testament, is the Lord himself. It's an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. You can see it in, Psalm, in Genesis when uh, the Bible said three men came to Sodom and these three men came and then one of them disappeared and the other two went down there and destroyed. One that one was the Lord. And the angel of the Lord is appearing. That's what an angel is. The angel, an angel is an appearance. That's the best definition you can get for an angel, an appearance. It's an appearance of the Lord. They are ministering spirits. But when God lets you see one, they take a body on as a young man. Any angel in the Bible is pictured as a young male, probably 30, the age Jesus was when he appeared and began his public ministry. There are no female angels in the Bible. There are no long, blonde-haired angels in the Bible with wings. No such thing. When they seen an angel in the Bible... They thought it was a, just, a, just a young man looked like he was going to the army or something like that, uh, a young man. And uh, they, uh, now, now you may be sitting there tonight saying, oh my goodness, Brother Danny, this, that's, that's terrible. That's because you've been, you've been conditioned all your life to think angels are women with wings. And there's no such thing as that. There's, it's not in the Bible, tell, trust me. <laughs> I've read it a bunch of times. Uh, they thought they were young men. If they had had wings they wouldn't have mistaken them for an average young man. I don't think. Now, cherubim and seraphim and them, them kind of creatures have wings, but not angels. Now, let's, let's continue reading here. Uh, where are we at? We was at, we was at uh, number, number 11, the angel of the Lord there. He appears to Moses. He appears to Abraham. He appears to Jacob. And as a matter of fact, he spoke to uh, Moses face-to-face uh, -face talking to him, but you know that in the Old Testament it said no man can look upon God and live, and that's why he told Moses, he said, you can see my hind hinder parts and sort of hid Moses like that. Uh, nobody's seen God's face. Did you see the eclipse the other day? You can look at the sun easier than you can look at God. He made the sun. You can look at God Almighty in his glory and live. It'd burn your eyes out. Uh, so uh, look at verse number 13. Thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Look at that verse. Now, you want to word on human nature? You don't think them people is just like we are today? Here's an angel appears to a man and say, Thou mighty man of valor. And you know what he does? He looks at me and said, Lord, if you're among us, why are we in the mess we're in? Isn't that just like we'd do? God, if I'm really right with you, why am I having to go through this? Why can't I get my bills paid? Why is that? Now, what's the answer to that question? Israel backslid. <laughs> That's why there's the mess is in. But sometimes stuff just happens. And he said, if I'm a mighty man of valor, why, are, why is this happening? Why is that happening? And where, where be all the miracles? That's what a lot of people say. Why, ain't they, why don't God work miracles no more? Why don't, how come God don't work? And, and there's where you get off. If you're not careful, there's where you'll get off and you'll manufacture you're a fake miracle because you really want to see God do a miracle. Let me tell you, you listen, if God don't, wants to do a miracle, he can do one. And if he don't, he don't. But he's still God anyway. And we serve him by faith. If we never see a miracle, we say, you know what the Lord said? Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Amen, that's us, buddy. I've never seen a miracle. I mean, you know what I mean. I've never seen, I know people that claim they have. I know people said they've, I know one guy said he healed this guy and his leg grew out longer. I've never seen that. I believe God does miracle. I believe God does heal. I believe, but I've, I've never seen anything. I've never seen an angel. 
I've never seen a demon that I know of. Uh, I think I've met a couple, uh, but uh, that I couldn't prove it. But he said, uh, he said, uh, why, where's all the miracles? If if we're so right with God, where that? And the Lord said, uh, verse. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. If not, I sent thee. Isn't that something? God said, You go get them, boy. I'm with you. And he said, verse 15, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. That's a good way to be, y'all. That's a good way to be. That's why God used Gideon. That's why God used Gideon. Gideon didn't look up there and he said, you need anything done, Lord? I'm your man. I'm better. I'm smarter. I'm more. You know what he said? I'm just a poor little old guy out here in the middle of nowhere. I can't do nothing, God. There's the way you get God to bless you. As a matter of fact, there are seven qualifications for God to really use you, and I'm going to name them off to you. Gideon had them all. Number one, he was conscious and convinced of his true natural state. He realized he wasn't nothing. Number two, he had no confidence in the flesh. Number three, he had an attentive ear to prophecy. He listened to prophecy. Number four, <laughs> I can't. He, he, he said, uh, did not the Lord bring us up? He knew the Lord was God. Number four, he was obedient in small things. Little bitty things, like the like the wood stuff like that. Number five, uh, he had power to do great things by the spirit of the Lord. Number six, he was unafraid to criticize false religions. He preached against them false religions. And number seven, he had the peace of God through his grace. And there's scripture for all of them. But we got to move on quickly tonight. Uh, he said, I'm going to look at verse 16. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he did, thousands of them. Gideon said, I can't do this, Lord. He said, look, buddy, by the time I get through with you, you're going to kill that crowd like there's one man. Bam. And he, they killed thousands. Of, in the next chapter, you know, his army gets down to 300 but I want to get to this thing about this sign business, and that's why I'm rushing tonight. Let's just read the rest of this, and then we'll get to the sign business. Depart not hence, I pray thee, till I come unto thee. Bring forth thy present and set it before thee. And he said, I will until thou come again. Tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made a kid. That's a goat. Guy got mad at me one time up at New Manor years ago, and uh, he said, I'm going to go up there and rebuke that preacher. And they said, Why? He said, I'm tired of him calling these children kids. That's a goat. And I didn't even know it. And so they said, he's going to rebuke me. I said, get up here, kids. Come on up here and sing. A kid is a goat. But a kid is a kid, too, I reckon. I don't know how they got started calling little kids kids. But uh, he got a kid and unleavened cakes of ephah of flour, the flesh he put in a basket and brought forth broth in a pot and put it under the oak and presented it. All right, he, he, he made an offering to the Lord. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, angel of God said unto him, take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. So he put the flesh and the bread on that rock, poured out the broth, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh of the unleavened cakes and there rose up fire out of the rock. That's been tried to imitate for years. Fire coming out of a rock and consumed the flesh and the cakes and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Then when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. You know how you know that was the Lord? That's exactly what he told him when he rose from the dead. Peace be unto thee, fear not. You see that? You see that New Testament concealed in the Old Testament? He said, peace be unto thee, fear not. Same thing Jesus said at the resurrection. Peace be unto thee, fear Same man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he built an altar there and called it Jehovah Shalom, which is this day, Ophrah, 
and the Ezraites. All right? Now, they always marked it. When God did something big, they always marked it. And it came to pass that same night, the Lord said, take the father's bullock, young bullock, even the second bullock. Now, why did he say the second bullock? Probably because the Midianites done killed the first one or they'd offered it to another God backslid because God always demanded the first. But he let them bring the second bullock, see that, of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal thy father's son, cut down the grove that is by it. Now, don't you look what you're reading, y'all, and build an altar of the Lord thy God on top of this rock and to order the place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. And Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord said, and because he feared his father's household, he did it by, he couldn't do it by day, but did it at night. And they arose early in the morning and went to the altar of Baal and cast it down. And the grove was cut down, the second bullock offered that was built. Okay, now let me catch you up to where we are. First, the fire comes out of this rock and burns that up. That's God saying, see there? I'm, you're right. Everything's right. I've accepted it. And now he said, all right, Gideon, now I want you to go down there and destroy them false gods. The first thing a person does or a nation does when they get right with God is get rid of the false gods. Same with me and you. If you've got some false god in your life, you're not going to be right with God until you're willing to destroy it. If, if you've got dirty movies in your house, if you've got dirty music in your car, if you've got, uh, if you're got money that ain't yours, you're trying to steal it or something, you're not going to get right with God until you destroy the false gods. All right? Now watch this. He said the groves. How many of you have ever wondered what them groves were in the high place? We all have. I used to read that over and over. The groves. Why is there always them groves? Well, they'd have groves of trees up on high places, and they'd have statues in them groves, and they would worship other gods in there. And the Lord told Gideon, he said, get rid of them. And Gideon was scared because it was his daddy. His daddy. And he took a bunch of men, went up there by night, went bam. Knock Baal over, just like they did old Dagon back yonder in Samuel. Cut him down, cut the trees down. The next morning, them guys got up, and their god was dead and knocked over, and the trees was cut down. Now, now, if you want to put that in perspective, it's cold in here, y'all. Don't you think? Uh, I, I know to see a couple of you covered up. It's, uh, but I'll, uh, feels good to you, brother. Yeah, it's cold. Uh, but anyway, it was things too far down. Um, what was I talking about? The, the, cutting them grows down? It'd be like this. It'd be like boys getting on fire for God and going to the family reunion and going out in the backyard up north. You don't see it much around here. And knocking the statue of Mary over and cutting down their grove and throwing it in the fire and burning it. Them people would have a heart attack. Them people would have a heart attack. That's, I mean, we don't understand that because we're raised in the South and we're, we've been raised around Baptist churches all our life. We don't realize how much they reverence them statues and them groves. You go down to the, to the hospitals, them, them big hospitals in Charlotte. They got that lab, labyrinth where you walk the labyrinth. I mean, this is the way you pray. You walk and walk a little old path like that right there and that's supposed to help you pray. Just stupid stuff like that. Ignorant. It's ignorance. They worship in ignorance and there's statues and, and bushes and everything. Man, how do you think that would go over to family reunion? So Gideon had to do that and he got rid of them and I'm telling you, them, there's mom and dad like that heart attack. Now let's move real quick and we're going to talk about this sign business. And, and they said, who done this thing? Verse 29. They said, Gideon. And they said, bring him out. Uh, we're going to kill him. And Joyce, uh, will you plead for Baal? Will you save him? Why can't he, he, if he be a god, let him plead for himself? That's a good question right there. If Baal's so great, how come he can't keep a few rednecks from cutting him down at night? I've always wondered about that. Why people would say, okay, we're moving. Let's get our god and put him in the trunk and take our, I don't want a god I have to pick up and take with me. I'd want one to pick me up and take me somewhere. Then the Midianites, he called on Jerubbabel saying, let Baal plead against him because he'd thrown down his altar. They ain't no Baal's a bunch of junk. He's a devil. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites, 33, came to the east, were gathered together and went over and pitched in Jezreel. 
Here we go, 34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet. Now there again, can you see that? Can you see that? What's a trumpet blowing in the Old Testament picture? I'm preaching. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people thy transgression. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet. That still happens today. The Spirit of God comes on men and they preach. Some of them old preachers, they had the Spirit of God on them when they preach. I hope and pray. I'm not the best preacher in the world, but I pray and I plead with God for his spirit to be on me when I preach. Amen? Amen. And look here. He blew the trumpet. In verse 35, he sent messengers and uh, who was gathered after him, sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali. They come up to meet them. And Gideon said, here we go. And I will say this and we're through. This is what I've been trying to get to. Unto God, if thou wilt save Israel by my hand. Now look here, you'll see Gideon's humanity. If. God's already appeared to him. God's already let an angel come. God's already, and now he says, are you really going to do this, Lord? If. I need a sign. I need a sign. And I've been asked a hundred times since I've been preaching, Brother Danny, is it all right to ask God for a sign? Now, I'm going to ask y'all who has and who ain't. I'd about guarantee you about everybody in here has. I have. But is it right? Is it scriptural? Is it okay? Is it not okay? Here we go. If thou wilt save Israel by my hand, verse 37, I will put a fleece. There it is. There's where it comes from. Listen, that has become the standard talk of people throughout the history of putting out a fleece. People don't even know it's in the Bible say that. Isn't that something? How the King James Bible controls the news media and the thoughts of lost people in the, in the world and uh, bankers and lawyers. They'll say, well, I'm just putting out the fleece. And they don't even know why they say that. They got it from Gideon. They got that from Gideon. Here's what he said. This is a fleece, wool. I put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only and it be dry upon the earth, then I'll know that you'll save Israel by my hand. He should already know it. God already told him he would. And it was so, for he rose early in the morning, Mara, and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleet in a bowl full of water. All right, here's what he done. He said, Lord, I'm gonna take my, I'm gonna take my fleece here. God, are you really calling me to do this? I don't know if you are or not. I mean, I just seen an angel the other day and you told me, but I kind of wonder if you really meant that. Ain't that the way we do? He's doubting. He's doubting. She says, all right, Lord, if you really, if, if you really call me, I'm going to put this down on the ground. Now, tomorrow morning, let all the dew fall on that and the ground be dry. He goes in there and goes to sleep, gets up the next morning. Well, I believe I'll check. Well, I'll be. And that thing was soaking wet, and he wrung a, a bowl full of water out of it, and the ground was dry. You'd think, what would you think? I mean, if that would happen, you'd say, Glory to God, it's a miracle. And look what he done. Are you sure that was really you that did that? Now, you see yourself in that? You see how God put these men in the Bible? Ain't that the way? Listen, y'all may be way more spiritual than I am, but that's me. That's me. The Lord can show me something 10 times, and I still say, is it really you? And I'm, I mean, it's embarrassing sometimes. Don't you do that? Don't you think, Lord, is this really you? I mean, he can come down to your, your room and say, do it. But how do I know this is really you, Lord? Look here. Gideon said to God, let not thine anger be. Don't get mad at me, Lord. I'm going to ask you one more time. Here's the way I'm going to know. This time, let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. And upon all the ground. And God did so that night. And there was dew on all the ground. So the next time he said, Lord, if that was really, really you, this time let all the ground be wet and that be dry. He goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning, that thing just as dry as my jacket. Now, here's the question. Here's the question. Uh, he's still doubting. Uh, there, let me say this. There is no place in the New Testament where it tells us it's okay for us to ask for signs. We're supposed to accept God's word by faith. If we don't see nothing, 
if we don't feel nothing. He said it, we believe it, that settles it. Amen? Amen. Now, they didn't have the Bible. He didn't have the New Testament. Therefore, me personally, I don't think it's scriptural for us to ask for sign. Have I done it? Yes. Will I do it again? Probably will. There's no scripture that says you can't, but it's real dangerous. And I tell you what you better do. If you start asking God for a sign, you better not take that lightly. That's a serious thing. Here's what you do. I ain't dumb. I've been doing this a long time. We ask the Lord to show us. Now, Lord, I don't really know if that's your will for me or not, but if it is, you know, we, and we ask him something that's probably going to go our way. Amen. Like, like Lord, I, I, are you really calling me to, to Ghana, Africa, to be a missionary? If you are, let a pink elephant walk in that door in five minutes, God, and I'll know it's your will. Now, see, yeah, that's how we do. Amen. That's stretching a little bit, but you know how you do when you ask for signs? You slant the odds your way. If you're really serious, slant the odds the other way. All right, Lord, if you really want me not to go, let a pink elephant walk in there. See, ask him the odds going against you. Now, we've all done it. Lord, if you want me to go here, let that red light change before I get to it. Lord, if, if it's meant to be for me to do thus and so, let my brother call this morning. You know, stuff like that. Nine times out of ten, we just want a convenient way out and don't want to pray something through. And uh, Now, if it's, if it's life or death, if it's a life change, I, I personally believe, you know, you're buying a car, buying a house. I know people that say, uh, I prayed about it, and I prayed, God, I'm going to offer them $10,000 for this car. If it's your will for me to have it, let it work. If it's not, I ain't going to do it. Now, is that wrong? Is that right or wrong? I don't, I don't guess it's wrong, but that don't necessarily mean God's letting that happen. God, if it's your will for me to marry that person, that's what people do. If it's your will for us to get married, boy, I sure hope so. So if it's your will for us to get married, you know, uh, 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 one guy said this, like this. Here's you. I'll say this and I'm going to let y'all go. I've run my mouth long enough. Here's you. Here's me. Guy come in one time to work and this guy was sitting there and he had a half a box of donuts and half of them was eight. And he said, I thought you was on a diet. He said, I am. He said, well, who eat all these donuts? He said, I did. He said, I was on my way to work this morning and I said, I asked God if it is his will for me to stop and get some donuts that he would let a parking place be empty right in front of Dunkin' Donuts. And I would know that it was the will of God if there was a parking place empty right there. And he said, you know, after six times around the block, there was a parking place open. That's us. Amen. I'm through right there. I got my point home then. Didn't I? How many of y'all done stuff like that right there? You ask God for a sign, and finagle around where it's going to go your way. Well... Uh, that's, that's not a good idea. You're better off just to trust God by faith. My preacher always told me, I'm, I'm leery of people that are always saying, well, I prayed and God told me to do this, and God told me to do it. It ain't that simple, y'all. I wouldn't do that. I don't advise people to do it. I don't do it myself, and I don't advise you to do it. There's been very few times in my life when I felt like I knew God told me to do something. Probably, if we got the completed scripture, uh, they require a sign before they believe. I don't think you should. I, Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh a sign. And ain't going to be no sign given to it. But Jonah's a prophet. You done had your sign, you didn't believe it. So be careful about asking for signs. Pray. You, my pastor taught us, he said, say, I feel... The, the, the best of my knowledge, I believe the Lord would have me to do this. Be careful about saying, God told me this. God, I know people like that. It makes you sick to be around them. They're like they got this little hotline between them and God, and he talks to them first. It ain't that simple, and it ain't that easy. wonder why he don't never tell them to go start a bus route. 
or give their yeah or witness gives their money to the poor. Yeah, isn't that weird the way it, it it always has it there together like that? He's teaching. I'm sorry, y'all. I didn't mean to keep. I know them kids are driving Cecily crazy out there, but we'll go ahead and stop right there. Try to cram too much in tonight. I'll try to, but we'll never get through if I don't. You you get bogged down in stuff, stay for years. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you for this great study on human nature. I pray that you would help us tonight. I pray that your will will be done in our life. Show us, Lord, if, if you ever do want us or we have to pray for some kind of sign or something, Lord, let it be right, let it be scriptural, and let it be your will and not just us and our own thinking, our own desires. Have you in our hearts this evening? Bless everybody as they go. In Jesus' name, amen.